okay that's about it so okay so i think that we can maybe start and 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 i will be admitting uh, all people coming up to this moment so uh, there is no problem if if anybody comes late so welcome everybody to this new session of the seamless seminar course uh, today we are pleased to have with us uh, professor ramon codina from upc and simne and the topic of the seminar is reduced order models and the variational multiscale method for flow problems um ramon uh the floor is yours <laughs> the floor. although in this case okay. it's not it's not whatever it is is mine <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you uh thank you thank you also for the invitation uh, i wonder am i the first one to make the seminar this way yeah you're the first one yeah so this okay. is the, the what the honor let's say yeah <laughs> i'm honored <laughs> okay so let's see if it works uh if no <laughs> i always have the let's say excuse to say that i i, I was uh, i was the first okay let me try then yeah. to to make the presentation presentation uh, let me see if that works okay so I'm sharing my screen in principle and uh, no, that's that's not what I want just one minute Okay, so do, do you see the presentation? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, the topic, as, as Ignacio said, the topic of the presentation is about reduced order models and the link with the variational multiscale method for, for flow problems. So this is a work that started uh, long ago. In fact, it started um, uh, with uh, I started that with uh, Joan Bages and, and Professor Udelson maybe about 10 years ago. And what I will present here is essentially um, work, part of the work that Ricardo Reyes has been doing in his, uh, in his PhD thesis that was defended uh, about a month ago. So that's the outline of the talk. I will uh, first uh, present the objectives and set the problem. And then there are two main uh, sections. One is about model reduction. I will try to explain a little bit the idea behind that. And the other section is about the variational uh, full order model and reduced order model formulations. So I will use these two acronyms very often. FOM stands for full order model and ROM stands, stands for reduced order model. Uh, then I will show a couple of numerical examples and I will end with the conclusions. So the objectives. Uh, wh wh which is the main objective of this talk? The main objective is to apply the variational multiscale concept, which is a concept that has been developed in the, in the framework of finite element methods, of stabilized finite element methods, to the field of reduced order models and in flow problems, because that's my main field uh, of research. So the idea is to link those, uh, those two concepts together. First, variational multiscale, and then reduced order models. Why? Uh, well, the reason is quite simple. Reduced order models can be written in a variational form. So they, they are, in fact, variational problems that are discretized uh, somehow. Uh, that's equivalent to projection, but I prefer to look at them as, uh, as, as variational problems. And um, variational problems that have a certain very particular way to construct the basis of the space where you are going to seek the solution. So um, that's the only difference that uh, from the conceptual point of view between finite elements and reduced order models in general. So we have a different basis, but that is in fact irrelevant from the conceptual point of view. Of course, it's not for the implementation and not for the um, results that you get. But since the idea is the same, only the, the, the bases are different, you may expect, and in fact, you encounter the same instability problems as for the finite element method, um, in particular in flow problems. These instabilities in the case of, uh, of uh, fluid problems in fluid mechanics are essentially, in principle, the need to interpolate with different 
spaces uh, the different unknowns, velocity and pressure, for example, or others. And when you have convection dominated flows, it is well known that uh, if the fusion is small, I mean, the flow is dominated by convection, then you may encounter problems. So these same problems, these same instability problems, may be encountered as well in the case of the reduced order models. Uh, the idea is simple. It's not, uh, we are not the first to do that. I mean, the idea is to link variational multiscale and ROM. Uh, so it's uh, it's very quite natural. So what makes our approach, uh, let's say, original, is that we use uh, several features of uh, variational multiscale that uh, are particular of uh, our group. We use what we call orthogonal subgroup scales, which now are particularly natural. I will try to explain why, but orthogonal subgroup scales fit perfect in the context of ROM. We use dynamic scales. I will also try to explain what that means. That has uh, proven to be uh, crucial in many numerical examples. And we use a nonlinear tracking of the subgrid scale, but that's not that important as the other two items. So uh, this is the these are the objectives of the of the talk. So uh, let me introduce a notation that I will use later for the spaces in play and for the uh, variational multiscale method. First, I will write with this letter script uh, I, uh, Y, the space where the continuous problem is posed. So this is the space where we look for the, uh, for the function, for the unknown. I will always consider that the full order model, so the, 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 the let's say, high fidelity model that is also called in the context of ROM, it is a finite element uh, space. So we, we have a, a high fidelity approximation, which is uh, a finite element method, okay? And that will be our full order model space that I will uh, indicate with a subscript H as usual. In the context of variational multiscale, what you do essentially, I will go back to this uh, idea, but what do you do is you split the unknown into the component that belongs to the finite element space and the remainder. And in fact, what you do is you approximate that remainder, okay? That remainder is what is called subgrid scale in general. And that's what you approximate, in fact. For example, the Golurkin method consists uh, of taking the subgrid scale equal to zero. That's an approximation that leads to the Golurkin method. Uh, that space of subgrid scales will be denoted by Y tilde in, in, in what follows. Okay, so that's for the full order model, for the uh, finite element variational multiscale model. As we will see, the idea of reduced order models is to construct a space of much smaller dimension than the full order model that I will indicate by uh, YR, with the subscript R, that will refer to the reduced order space. Um, that inclusion is, in fact, uh, very strict in the sense that the dimension of YR is orders of magnitude smaller than the dimension of YH in general, in general. And that space YR has also a space of, a space of subgrid scales because I anticipate that our thesis is that you can use the same VMS variational multiscale method for the ROM as for the FOM, okay? So that... Uh, uh, reduced order model space, that ROM space has a space of subgrid scales that will be, not, that will be denoted by this symbol uh, uh, brief, uh, brief uh, Y, okay? I will call it brief Y. So the picture is this one. We have the, the, the space where the continuous problem is posed, Y, then that can be split as the direct sum of the finite element space plus, plus the space of subgrid scales for the finite element space, for the form, and in turn, Y can be split into the uh, ROM space YR plus the space of subgrid scales, but for the ROM space, okay? And since the ROM space is included in the form space, so the reduced order model space is a subspace of the full order mo uh, model space, the space of subscales for the uh, form model is going to be smaller than the space of subscales for the reduced order model. So we have this type of inclusion here. Uh, perhaps it is easy to understand if you look at this picture. 
We have YH, which is our finite element space, and Y tilde, which is the complementing of uh, YH in Y. So both two together uh, sum up uh, to Y, okay? And that's the picture that we have in the case of the reduced order model. We have YR, which is much smaller than YH, and the complement, so the space of subscales for, for YR, is brief Y, which of course is larger than tilde Y, which is the space of subgrid scales for the uh, form, for the full order model. Okay? So that's the notation I will use, and in this notation there are already several concepts uh, included. So the concept of the space where you look for the solution and the remainder, which is the space of subgrid scales, either of the form or of the ROM. Okay? Okay, so let's let's write down the variational problem that we will take as model problem. So my intention is not to talk about any particular model. I will, uh, in the examples, I will uh, write down the equations for uh, the Navier uh, for uh, for the Navier-Stokes case. But in general, uh, even though you, you you see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, symbols here, the idea is simple. We consider a general evolution problem of this form that uh, in which uh, in this format most problems in fluid mechanics can be fit so we have a temporal evolution multiplied by a certain mass matrix that may depend on the unknown for example in the case of compressible flows the um, temporal derivative is multiplied by the density for example so you have this uh, nonlinear dependence and then we have an operator that is in general nonlinear but is linear in the second slot. So that's why I have written L with two uh, slots, one to uh, account for the nonlinearities and the second slot that is linear, okay? And that's equal to a forcing term F. And in general, this operator L is an operator of second order. So we have the term of zero order, which is S of, as, uh, I mean, in the linear ar argument Z, it's, it's S of Z. Then a term of first order, derivatives with respect to space are denoted with this uh, subscript i, subscript i are, are the derivatives with respect to xi, the Cartesian coordinate. So we have first order derivatives here and there. I have split that for convenience because in the applications, uh, there, there is a part of these derivatives that are integrated by parts and another part that are not integrated by parts. So that's why I have split the first order terms in, in two parts. And then we have the classical expression of the second order terms, which are derivatives of certain coefficients, let's say diffusion coefficients, multiplied by derivatives of the unknown. And the nonlinearity is reflected by the fact that all these terms that are matrices in general depend on the unknown y. Okay? So when we put z equals y, we have a nonlinear problem. Okay, so that the, the problem that we have to solve is uh, this evolution equation, the first one, with boundary conditions, uh, a certain Dirichlet operator equal to uh, applied to the unknown equal to a given bound a given term. So it's not y equal to y d because depending on the problem, you cannot prescribe all the components of y. So you can prescribe only a few of them. Just think, for example, about incompressible flows. You can prescribe the velocity but not the pressure. That's why. You have a Dirichlet operator that depends on, on the problem. And also a, 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 a flux term that, uh, that um, also depends, maybe nonlinear, and is equal to something. So the flux and the Dirichlet operator are, of course, problem dependent. And since uh, we are considering a first order um, equation in time, we have to have also an initial condition of this form. Okay? So that's it. That's a very general problem. So just a, 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 a problem of first order in time and second order in space. And, and almost any equation you may think of uh, fits within this framework. Okay, and for this problem, we have to, if we want to do finite elements, we have to write down the variational form of this problem. So what we do is we integrate by the test function uh, V, uh, let me call it V here, um, and in, uh, you multiply by this test function and you integrate over the computational domain. That is represented here by these uh, parentheses or these angle brackets, that doesn't matter. Um, 
of course, when you multiply uh, the uh, differential operator by V, it is convenient for different theoretical and practical reasons to integrate a few terms by parts, particularly the second order terms. And that leads to the bilinear form B. Okay, so this term is simply represented by B once it is integrated by parts. That integration by parts allows you to impose the condition on the fluxes that uh, can be moved to the right hand side and you have this linear form L that accounts for both the forcing term and the uh, given fluxes on the boundary. At the end what you have, again very very general without entering the details, is a variational problem of this form. So we have the time evolution of the unknown multiplied by the test function plus that form B that is linear in the second and third arguments, so it's bilinear in the second and third arguments, and that um, may be nonlinear because of the dependence of all the matrices on the unknown, and that nonlinearity is uh, taken into account in this first uh, slot um, of B. Okay, very general problem. So even though you have, uh, you see, you see many symbols here, the concept is. Very simple, just a first order evolution problem in time and second order equation in space. That's it. Okay, so that's the problem we want to approximate. And uh, instead of uh, presenting first uh, what is the uh, fine Italian method that we use, I will talk a little bit about model reduction. So uh, you have to take, in my, uh, to take into account that you have a, a, a certain way to approximate that problem using finite elements, the one that you prefer. For the moment, it is irrelevant. What is the idea of model reduction? The idea of model reduction is that instead of solving with that problem that uh, you have, or that method that you use that may be uh, very costly, it's what we will call a high fidelity model, the full order model, we want to solve the problem with a reduced basis, with a much lower dimension, okay? with a space of much lower dimension. So I will start explaining the idea in, in a case where it is particularly natural, which is model redu reduction in solids. Okay? And I will uh, explain what is the model analysis in the case of solids. So suppose that you have that favorite method, favorite finite element method for a solid. So I, I have written before a first order evolution equation in time, but exactly the same applies to a second order evolution equation in time. And suppose I was saying that from that full order model, you are uh, led to this uh, algebra, this system of uh, ordinary differential equations where y now is uh, already discretized uh, in space. So you're, you're left with a problem that is uh, discrete in space and continuous in time and of second order for the in the case of solid mechanics okay and the important thing in solid mechanics so here that problem is posed in R and P and P stands for the number of points of the mesh in fact it would be the number of points multiplied by the dimension because uh, at each point you have um, in the case of solids uh, three unknowns which would be the three displacements for instance but the important, the important thing in solid mechanics is that M and K are positive definite. So that's very important. That, that property is what we don't have in fluids, and we will see how to overcome this, uh, this problem. So we know that the solution to this problem is of the form Y equals a particular solution plus the solution of the homogeneous problem. And the idea of the moral analysis is to assume that the solution of the homogeneous problem can be expanded in modes of this form. So the exponential of i, i is the, the square root of minus one, the, the imaginary unit, omega, certain number, time, so that's nothing but the harmonic time behavior, and multiplied by a vector phi that will be the vector of amplitudes. Okay, if we assume that the solution can be expanded in modes of this form, and we plug that expansion into the differential equation that we have to solve, we see that the pair phi omega, phi is a vector, omega is a scalar, must satisfy this relationship. That's very simple. We just have to uh, replace the second derivative of y by i squared, which is minus 1, omega squared, and then the exponential again. Here we have uh, k, k of y uh, equal to 0, 
and the exponentials will cancel out from both the first and the second term. So we have this, uh, this relationship between uh, omega and phi, which means that we have to solve this eigenvalue problem to find the, omega, the phi and the omegas that satisfy this equation. So we see that phi is the eigenvector with eigenvalue omega square of this generalized eigenproblem in which uh, the matrix uh, of the problem is k, which is positive definite, and the, let's say, the inner product associated to the eigenproblem has matrix M, which is the mass matrix, which is going to be always uh, symmetric and positive definite, okay? Good, so that's the, that's the situation. And now, once we have, of course, we have uh, uh, as many um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues as NP, which is the dimension of the space where we are. They may be equal, perhaps, they may be even zero, but in, in principle, we have as many as NP. And now we could, it can be shown, of course, that uh, these uh, eigenvectors are, um, uh, because ma the matrix K and M are symmetric and positive definite, uh, the eigenvectors are mutually orthogonal, so they are linearly independent, they are a basis because we have NP of them, and therefore we can expand the homogeneous solution in this form, that is exact, we can make that expansion, for certain amplifications coefficients AJ, and the idea of the model analysis is to take only a few terms of this expansion. So NP, maybe thousands or millions or whatever, a very large number, the, the number that you get from your full order model. But instead of uh, uh, NP terms, you take only a few of them. And a few means very few. So very few could be um, two, three, four, five, six, uh, something of that order, okay? Very few. Okay, with that we have, uh, the, that's the idea of the model analysis. And then we have the AGs that have to be determined by the initial conditions. Omega J are called uh, the frequencies in the case of uh, fluid mecha uh, solid mechanics. And, um, and Phi J are called the modes in the case of uh, uh, solid mechanics. Okay, this is the idea. But in this case, this is, the, this is a very simple example of model reduction. So, uh, in principle, we had this uh, large problem with many unknowns, with many degrees of freedom that is reduced very much um, by taking only R components instead of, of MP. Okay? I have now an example of this. Uh, I, I, we are doing with a, a colleague uh, a work on, on, on model reduction for incompressible, incompressible solids. And I have an example of the, of the, of the modes um, that he obtained. Uh, he's a colleague from Turkey that he obtained um, for a simple beam problem. <clears throat> In the case of a simple beam, so this is a clamped beam, clamped at, at the left uh, edge. Uh, if you if you write down the problem that I mentioned before, what you get, the phi's that you get are indicated, uh, are plotted here. So the first, these uh, three phi's on the left correspond, as you see, to bending modes, whereas these uh, three phi's that you see on the right correspond to uh, axial deformation, axial strain uh, modes. And uh, if you uh, consider the solution obtained with a few number of these terms, of, with different values of R, what you get is something like that. The error decreases very fast when you take, for example, uh, two nodes, uh, two modes, you have an error of the order of 10%. Uh, when you take uh, six modes, you have an error of the order of uh, four something percent. And then the uh, decrease is slower. Okay, so that's the idea of what you have in the case of solid mechanics. What about fluids? In the case of fluids, when we use our full order model, we get a, a problem of this form. It has the same structure as before, but, well, it's a first order evolution in time instead of a second order evolution. But the, 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 the problem is, the difficulty is that matrix K is not anymore symmetric and positive definite. It's an arbitrary matrix. It can be non-symmetric and, of course, non-definite, okay? So, what do we do? 
the, the, the model analysis does not work, obviously, in that case. Uh, we cannot guarantee that we have a complete set of eigenvectors that are mutually orthogonal. So what is done is, uh, is the following. is what the procedure that is called proper orthogonal decomposition. The idea is the following. Suppose that with your full order model, you step in time, and from the time stepping, you get, uh, let's say, solution at the solutions at different time steps. We will call these solutions <coughs> snapshots, okay, pictures of the solution at certain time steps, and are represented here by y1, y2, up to ys, okay. So, the idea of the proper orthogonal decomposition is to consider the matrix made by these snapshots, is the matrix that we have here, <coughs> which is a matrix of, uh, of dimension NP times s, the number of snapshots, and to perform the singular value decomposition of that matrix. What is the singular value decomposition? The singular value decomposition of an arbitrary matrix is this a representation of this matrix into three matrices, one which is diagonal, of course non-square in general, and the other two, uh, the, the, the matrix on the left and the matrix on the right <coughs> that are unique matrices. So these are made by ve uh, vectors that are mutually orthogonal. The first one is a matrix of, uh, of dimension NP times NP, whereas the second one is a, a matrix of dimension uh, S times S. So the idea of, of the proper orthogonal decomposition is to perform this singular value decomposition and consider as <coughs> basis of your approximation the left the so-called left generalized eigenvectors, which are the which are the vectors that appear on the on this matrix. Okay, so instead of having the modes that we have in the case of solid mechanics, which are quite natural, in in the general case when k is not symmetric and positive definite, what we do is we perform the uh, singular value of the composition of that matrix and consider the left generalized eigenvectors as the uh, basis where we want to uh, that we will use to uh, construct our reduced order model space so now the idea is very simple well first uh, uh, the, the property is the one that i mentioned before these vectors phi are mutually orthogonal if required we can impose that the orthogonality holds with respect to the mass matrix m which is very convenient at least uh, theoretically although in practice uh, things work similarly if we take uh, m equal to the identity and then what we do is we approximate the unknown the, the solution to the problem by only a few terms of this expansion of course if instead of r we put np that would be let's say exact because uh, as i said the phi's are a basis in r and p but the idea is to take only a few of these modes again a few means a few, it means uh, five, four, six instead of millions, okay? So maybe 20, in the case of fluids, sometimes we, ha we have to go up to 20 or, or 30, but not more than that. When we are solving a problem that in the full order model, in the FOM, has millions of degrees of freedom, in the reduced order model, in the ROM, has only, let's say, 20, 30 degrees of freedom at most, at most, usually much less. Uh, now a remark. The remark is that uh, these, uh, um, uh, what we said, we called uh, modes before in the in the case of the of this of solid mechanics, these uh, basis uh, functions phi can be understood either as vectors or as finite element functions if your form is a finite element method. That's what I'm considering. So that array phi, as I say here, can be considered either as a vector or as a finite element function. How, how can we identify this with a finite element function? Well, in the way that this is written here. In fact, this array phi will have uh, um, different components that will correspond to the nodes of the finite element partition because uh, uh, we are assuming that our full order model is a finite element method. So, this phi i has these components and when you multiply these components by the shape functions the standard shape functions of the finite element method you get a function so there is a one-to-one -one identification of phi i as a vector or 
phi i is a finite element function that will be used to construct our reduced order model space. So this is the idea of the POD. The, those five, uh, five functions, the, the, the basis functions, have uh, different properties. The most important one is this orthogonality that I already, I already mentioned. Um, they have to satisfy homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's a, that's a technical issue. If you have a problem where you don't have homogeneous boundary conditions, which is very natural, you have to make a shift uh, of the boundary conditions but using the mean, the mean centric trajectory method. But there is, there is a irrelevant. This is a technical issue of the singular value decomposition. Uh, the important thing is that, that basis has uh, optimal approximation when you truncate that. So uh, uh, you have um, you have uh, that collection phi one up to phi n p. So the result that uh, is stated there is that if you just truncate that basis, the approximation is optimal. It's the best you can you can do. Okay, it's not that you have to select. Uh, in a in a clever way the basis functions for your uh, uh, reduced order model no 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 you just have to take the first the second and then stop whenever you want but you don't have to to select exactly the same happens in the case of model analysis in in solid mechanics here is an example of of uh, how these bases look like in the in in, in in a fluid mechanics problem this is uh these those are the bases that were obtained in a particular case of a convection diffusion reaction equation with a convection given by a wet flow, in fact, a shear flow. So the flow is, uh, is a shear flow. Velocities, uh, the top velocities go to the right, the bottom velocities go to the left. And um, that's uh, obtained on a certain quite fine finite element mesh. And those are the six first modes that you get in that problem. That problem has, a, has an initial uh, let's say temperature because it's a convection diffusion reaction equation let's say a, a concentration or temperature whatever at the middle and and zero elsewhere and and if you compute the full order model solution and then from that full order model solution you uh, you collect a, a certain number of snapshots and from those snapshots you perform the singular value decomposition and you take the first six left generalized eigenvectors, what you get is this, okay? So th this is the basis that you would use in dimension six. If you would like to solve that problem using a reduced order model, okay? So that, that picture is included here just to, to see that those bases may be uh, quite, quite uh, complex, okay? It's not the, the standard finite element basis and that's it, no, no, it's uh, it's not that you pick a few of the finite element bases, but uh, you have to combine them in a way that is uh, a priori uh, impossible to know. Okay, so that, that was about model order reduction. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the variational uh, multiscale method applied to both the, the full order model and the reduced order model formulation. And as I said at the beginning, our thesis, our, our claim, is that you can use the same variational multiscale formulation formulation for both the FOM and the ROM, which uh, seems a pretty natural idea, but uh, but uh, if you look at the literature, you will see that it's not that natural <clears throat> or not that common, I would say. So let me explain a little bit what is the variational multiscale for the full order model. The, how, what is the idea behind the variational multiscale model for the, in the case of the finite element method, let's say. So we consider that YH is a finite element space and uh, tilde Y is the space of subgrid scales, okay? Let me replace the time derivatives by a discrete uh, finite difference approximation, although this is not, not very important. So the idea of the variational multiscale method is to split the unknown into one component that I have called here yh and another one that is y tilde and split the uh, test functions likewise. So that means that we can obtain first an equation testing with functions in the finite element space and then another equation testing with functions in the space of subgrid scales. Of course, um, if we test 
in functions in both the spaces, it will be equivalent to test uh, in functions in the whole space. Okay. And then all terms are split into the finite element contribution and the subscript scale contribution. For example, the temporal derivative here and the temporal derivative of the subscript scale here. So if you add up these two terms, you get the original one because y is yh plus tilde y. The same in the bilinear form B, recall that it is bilinear in the in the last two arguments, in the third and in the second and third argument. So uh, yh plus y tilde is uh, is y. And the same again for the equation, let's say when the test function uh, belongs to the space of subgrid scales. And here I have remarked in red that you cannot do anything with the nonlinear terms in principle, so you have to leave them as they are. So all nonlinearities have to be uh, kept as they are, or maybe you you want you may approximate y in the nonlinear term simply by uh. That's a possibility. But you could also replace y by uh plus u tilde, and that's what we call nonlinear tracking of the superior scales. In flow problems, we have found that this is not particularly uh, relevant. I mean, both options are, are, are equally valid. That's what uh, our experience uh, says. But there is already an important thing to remark here. The important thing to remark is this uh, red slot. <clears throat> we consider that the subgrade scales depend on time. We don't neglect the time derivative of the subscale, subgrid scales. So this is not the usual way to proceed, but we have found that this is uh, very important and that gives a lot of robustness to the method. So uh, this is what we call dynamic subgrid scales because we take into account their time variation. And as I said, we found that very, very important. Later, I will mention the other characteristic, the other main feature of our, our approach. Okay, so that's the idea. That's the idea of the variational multiscale. Now what comes are technicalities that I will uh, not um, detail. Just uh, let me explain what is, what is the idea. As I said at the beginning, the idea of variational multiscale is to split the unknown into the finite element component yh and the remainder, the subscript scales y, y tilde, and approximate y tilde. Okay, approximate that. For example, by zero, that would be the Galerkin method. But of course, that's not what we do. But we want to approximate only the subgrid scale, not the, the space derivatives of the subgrid scales, but because we will make, uh, let me anticipate that all the approximations to Y tilde are quite crude. So constants or something inside each element. So we cannot expect to approximate the derivatives of Y tilde. So what we have to do is to move all derivatives of y tilde, for example, that appear here in the bilinear form in the last two arguments uh, b, we have to move the derivatives that appear on u tilde to the test function. Okay, that's what we have to do. That's the concept. Because we don't want to approximate derivatives of y tilde. So in this process of moving derivatives from y tilde to vh, there are different operators that appear, this formula joint of the differential operator, the formula joint of the fluxes, and the residual term. But uh, I will not uh, detail that. So at the end, what you get is, is what I have written here. So of course, the details are, <clears throat> are not important. What is important is to see that we have been able to obtain an expression that involves the subgrid scales without derivative, okay? That's for the equation in the finite element space, and that's for the equation in the space of subscales, okay? Okay, and now the point is, of course, if we have to solve this equation, this is as complex as the original problem. So that is the equation projected, let's say, or tested in the space of, of uh, subgrid scales. That is as difficult as for the original problem. So the, what we do and what everybody does, of course, is to approximate the differential operator, L, simply by a matrix, tau, tau minus one, multiplying y. So the way to justify this crude approximation um, has different options. I mean, 
You can do it through the introduction of bubble functions or Green's functions or uh, Fourier analysis. That's what we prefer. But there are way, different ways to do that. I mean, to justify this crude approximation. Of course, the Galerkin method consists in taking that equal to zero, as I said before. Okay, so it's even cruder than than what is usually done. Okay, and now when when you make this approximation, you have this equation, this evolution equation for the separate scales, because we don't neglect the time derivative of these separate scales. So again, many symbols, but the concept I believe is not that difficult. So we split y into y h and tilde y. We isolate tilde y because we don't want to approximate derivatives of, of uh, tilde y. And we make this crude approximation that comes from different sources that are beyond the, the scope of this uh, presentation. Then another feature, another feature of our, our approach, another original feature of our approach, is that we consider those uh, subgrid scales as orthogonal to the finite element space, L2 orthogonal. So <clears throat> in principle, you could do, uh, you could take them as uh, belonging, as proportional to the residual, the finite element residual, which has been defined here, by the way, I should have stressed that a little more. So this is the finite element residual. That means that is the uh, point was residual that you would obtain if instead of putting the unknown y, you put the uh, finite element solution yh. Okay, so as I was saying, um, you could take the, the, that y tilde is directly proportional to the residual. That's uh, the most common approach in, that you will find in the literature. But we prefer to take the orthogonal projection of it, leading what we call the space of orthogonal separate scales or the, or, or the orthogonal separate scale method. And as I will mention later, this is very natural in the context of reduced total models. As I mentioned, we don't neglect the time derivative of the subclitic scales. If you do, you get what we call quasi-static subscales, subclitic scales. If not, uh, we call the subclitic scales dynamic. And we've, we have found that very, very important in the applications. Um, finally, the third option is uh, the one that I already described briefly before. You can take, you, you can approximate y by yh in the nonlinearities. That is what we call linear subgrid scales, or you can keep the nonlinearity. You can replace y by yh plus the approximation to y tilde that we have from this uh, equation. So, okay, so that's the very brief idea of <coughs> of the of the method that we use. So this is summarized here. We have to solve this equation. This equation is the standard finite element equation plus two terms. One is this one that comes from the time derivative of the separate scales that we take into account. And the other is, after integration by parts, the one that you get um, uh, of the subscale multiplied by this operator that is the formula joint of the original differential operator. And that's the equation you have to solve to approximate y tilde. That is not a partial differential equation. It's just an evolution equation at each uh, point. It's like like uh, why why tilde behaves as an internal variable in the case of uh, solid mechanics. Okay, so you may think of y tilde. Those of you uh, familiar with problems in solid mechanics, you may think of y tilde as a, as an internal variable. In the case of in the case of orthogonal subcritical scales, that's what we favor. This term is identically zero because the subscale is orthogonal to the finite element function. Okay. Uh, well, that's the final method. It is uh, finally written here. So these ideas, these ideas, exactly what I said, can be applied exactly as I said to the reduced order model, exactly as I said. Now the reduced order model is constructed from this uh, basis phi obtained from the uh, proper orthogonal decomposition method that in fact those phi remember called from the singular value of the composition of the matrix of snapshots you take only r of them but they are finite element functions and therefore the uh, reduced order model space is a subspace of the finite element space <coughs> and if you apply again the vms method you will have you will consider the splitting of y into the reduced order model space the wrong space 
and the space of subgrid scales for the ROM. But before we consider that splitting. But nevertheless, the ideas are the same in the ROM as in the FOM. And then the problem that we propose to solve in the case of the ROM is this one, this equation written in blue. And these equations written in blue are exactly the same as the equations that we had for the full order model, except that we replace all fine entitlement functions that had a subscript age before, we replace them by uh, reduced order model functions that have a subscript R. Okay? But the idea is exactly the same. And that's it. So that's our message. Use the same. Okay. So two remarks. The first remark is uh, about the more than importance, I said here, on the importance of using orthogonal circuit scales. More than importance, than importance is uh, to highlight how natural they are in the context of reduced order models. And the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you want to characterize the space of subgrid scales uh, for the ROM, you have exactly this expression. It's as simple as that. What is the space of subgrid scales in the case of the ROM? Is the space of subgrid scales that we had in the FOM plus the terms of the basis that we did not consider when we constructed the ROM space. Okay, so we have the space spanned by phi from r plus one up to the total number of uh, the total number of uh, basis functions of the full order model space. Okay, so that's what we did not consider in the case when when constructed the ROM. So if uh, that space y tilde is orthogonal to the finite element of space, that's exactly the expression that we have for the uh, subgrid um, scale space of the ROM. Why? Because the phi functions are already orthogonal. Okay, So that space is made of, of functions orthogonal to the ROM space, because by construction in the SVD, in the, SVD the, the basis, the left generalized eigenvectors, are mutually orthogonal. And therefore, we have uh, this property. So if you increase the space of the ROM, the space of associated subgrid scales is smaller. Okay. So if you increase R to R plus 1, the space that you get is smaller than if you have uh, a certain value R. So that's the first uh, remark on the importance, or, or more than importance, is how natural orthogonal subgrid scales are in the context of reduced order models, and in particular, reduced order models based on the proper orthogonal decomposition. That's what we use. The second remark is that we have a natural error estimate. <coughs> All the theory that we have in the case of the FOM can be applied to the ROM, and we have uh, uh, stability and error estimates exactly the same way. And in fact, a final remark is that uh, something in which we have been working very recently is that uh, you can uh, also have the same a posteriori error estimate for the FOM as for the ROM, again, uh, based on the fact that we have the same approximation. So those uh, are technicalities in which I, I, cannot, I cannot enter now. There is also another technicality, but this is a detail that I don't want to, to skip. And it's the fact that in highly non or in generally non-linear problems, uh, we have to modify a little bit the method. So the method as such does not change because for linear problems it works uh, it works uh, well, but for non-linear problems we have to have this uh, so-called orthogonal petrov lurkin projection that modifies the the algebraic system to resolve, which is very small. So that is a, a technicality, but uh, I want. For those of you that uh, know more about that, I don't want to to skip this uh, this comment. Okay, so that's it. Section three: model reduction, basic ideas about model reduction. Section four: a variational multiscale for both the ROM and the FOM. And now let's see a couple of examples of how the method how the method works. 
And this, uh, these examples are particularized to the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So those are the operators, the general operators that were introduced before in the particular case of incompressible Navier-Stokes look like that. So why, for example, why, the unknown why is velocity and pressure. <coughs> so we'd have the velocity u and the pressure p. And those are the rest of the terms. So let's see how does that work. How does that work? So we have here the first example, which is the classical, the classical example of the flow past uh, a cylinder. There is a, a flow that comes from the left uh, and hits that uh, cylinder and provokes that vortex uh, shedding uh, behind the cylinder. Okay. So what we have in this uh, picture on the on the left on the top left is the uh, are the contours of velocity for the full order model. Okay, so th th that, that is what you get with the full order model. And that's what you get with the reduced order model. I don't have here exactly the number of bases of that, but it must be around 10 or 15, because uh, this is the so-called energy ratio, which is 0.8. Um, I don't want to explain what it is, but probably uh, I will mention later uh, in a particular case, the number of bases that we have. But here probably we have about 10 or 15 uh, degrees of freedom basis functions so the solution that you see is similar although not exactly the same <coughs> and what about the separate scales Th those those are represented here those are plotted here those are the separate scales for the full order model and those are the separate scales for the reduced order model as as, as you could expect these subscales the separate scales for the reduced order model are more important than for the for the full order model so you have somehow less error let, let's say for the full order model than for the reduced order model so th this is in velocities and something similar happens in pressures so that's the pressure of the full order model and that's the pressure that you get in the reduced order model and again the separate scales are much higher in the case of the reduced order model that's what you have in on the bottom right picture than in the full order model. In the full order model, you have much smaller uh, pressure separate scales. What about convergence? Uh, again, convergence here is measured in terms of the energy that you keep. Uh, the energy is uh, the sum of the the sum of the <coughs> eigenvalues that you take divided by the sum of the total number of eigenvalues. So one would be the the, the full order model, but uh, for example, point 0.8, that were the results shown before, corresponds to only a few. I don't remember if it was 10 or 15 uh, degrees of freedom. So here we compare the uh, orthogonal subgrid scales with respect to the non-orthogonal subgrid scales. This is the most common approach in the literature. And we found the orthogonal subgrid scales much more robust. Something similar can be said for the uh, dynamics of the scales. This is, these are, in fact, uh, very, very important. For dynamics of the scales, we get a more or less uh, reasonable convergence uh, when you increase the number of, of modes. Whereas if you don't take dynamics of the scales, you, you, you may encounter this strange behavior so that all in a sudden you increase the number of bases and you get a worse, a much worse uh, solution. Okay. This, this has happened consistently, so it's not, it's not only this, this example. And then a second example, which is the flow over a backward-facing step. Um, again, this is a very high Reynolds number. The flow comes from the left. There is this step that creates vortices that separate and, and, and evolve until the exit of the channel. Um, here we have the contours obtained, the velocity contours, the velocity norm contours, that you get for the full order model and for the reduced order model here with uh, something that is called hyper reduction in this case uh, that I, I haven't explained in this case we used uh, 21 as the dimension of the rom space whereas the dimension of the form was of the order of thousands of degrees of freedom okay so we reduced that uh, very significantly uh, and that's the same picture for pressures. The, the previous picture was uh, velocity contours, and that picture is uh, the picture of uh, pressure contours for the full order model and for the reduced order model. 
It is also important to, to see what happens at certain points, at certain reference points, that that is a more quantitative comparison. So uh, in, in this dashed line is the full order model and the blue line is the reduced order model, okay? We're using again 21 degrees of freedom for the reduced order space. That's the evolution um, of, uh, <coughs> of the velocity, of the velocity norm at a certain control point and that's the evolution of the pressure. As you see, with much, much less uh, degrees of freedom, you get a solution that is not uh, perfect, but uh, um, is, uh, uh, captures the physics of the original full order model. Okay, and the conclusions. So the conclusions are the following. First, uh, the, the most important one, well, let me, uh, let's say, summarize. I have tried to explain two main concepts, the concept of reduced order modeling from the very general point of view and the context of the variational multiscale method uh, for this model equation. And what uh, our claim is that what you have to do is to use the same model, okay? So that's the first conclusion. We have used the same variational multiscale formulation for both the FOM, which is a finite element method, and the ROM, okay, which is purely based, so based on the proper orthogonal decomposition. Um, that remark is uh, more or less a historical one. The Sapir scales in the ROM space do not belong to the FOM space. So that, uh, uh, that is simply saying that uh, uh, we split again the continuous space into the, in the, the ROM space and the space of subscales. Because one idea that uh, I had at the beginning that does not work as well as this one is that uh, the subscales of the ROM should be the complementary of the ROM space in the FOM space. And this does not work. That works, but uh, you have this, this approach is more robust, what I am presenting now. The, the third conclusion is that the use of orthogonals of these scales uh, shows an overall more consistent behavior when you take more basis functions than the non-orthogonal case. And the same can be said in the, for dynamic separate scale. So apart from the general concept, um, we use two original features of our variational multiscale method that have uh, shown to be very important in the case of ROM, which are the use of orthogonal separate scales and the use of dynamic separate scales. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ramon. Uh, it was very clear talk, uh, at least uh, I, I could uh, follow it uh, very clearly. So hopefully it worked for everybody, I guess. And I think we have time for maybe a couple of short questions. It's almost the time. If anybody wants to ask, just open the mic and, and talk. Well, if I may, sorry. Ricardo, go ahead. Uh, Ramon, could you go to slide 25? For a second, cool. yeah, that, uh, that 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 is not going to be so easy. But slide twenty-five. Let me let me uh, uh, share again my screen. Well, I'll make the question without the slide. It doesn't really matter. So, at a certain point, you were saying that you need to use a petrov galerkin approach yeah, yeah. on the discrete <laughs> system instead of using the, let's say, what you would have as a. Um, uh, let, let me call it library reduction. So essentially using the same elements you would use. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. You spend more of a, I mean, if you change the discrete form, you're actually changing everything. Or maybe I got you wrong. No, no, no. I mean, no, you don't change everything. So the idea, uh, let, let me say, first, first important remark. Um, uh, you don't need to do that in the case of linear problems. Okay? In linear problems, right. all the theory works well. In the case of non-linear problems, if you get a converged solution, you don't have to do anything. You again have to do the, the original method. The problem is when you don't converge. Okay? And if you don't converge, uh, that idea of using the petrov lurking projection instead of using the original projection was taken from a paper by the group of Farad and, and, and others that understand these as a preconditioning of the original system. Okay, so 
the idea is to consider that as a better condition system that, than the original one. Um, and that that is it. So it's it's difficult to say more about that because uh, because uh, it's something that we have observed in practice that it is much better to use that petrovsko lurkin projection in the case of non-linear problems. Let me insist on that because you develop all the theory and everything in the linear case, and then you move to non, to non-linear problems, and you have to design iterative algorithms that are beyond all what I have explained. So. But I mean, at the limit, when your nonlinear problem converges, so when your Newton Robson iteration converges, or whatever you want to call fixed point, let's say, yeah. the solution you obtain would be the same. So, for example, could I use line search instead to just to make an example to try to converge to the same, or is it a change in the, um, I mean, I guess the actual so. solution? So, uh, I, I don't quite understand your point. I mean, if you converge, you do converge to the same solution. That's it. So, for example, I could try another, any other quasi-Newton or acceleration or anything technique to... My guess is that, yes, you could. I don't know if, if at the end you will be bound to use that type of petrov golurkin I'm not sure about that. Um, but in principle, my guess is that if you are able to obtain a converged solution of the original problem, that should work. Although you have to be, let's say, how could I say, it, clever enough to design that that iterative scheme uh, so that it works. Okay. Yeah, because you have no guarantee that works. the solution of the yeah, my, my point is one is also. Pardon? I mean. I, do you have any guarantee that the solution of the second problem, the modified problem, is also a solution of the first? Oh, no, no, no. I say that, no, no, in the, of course, that depends on H. You will make an error that is uh, that depends on the approximation of space, of course. Of course, that's for sure. You see that what, what you don't change is the original problem. The original full order model problem does not change because you are simply multiplying that by another matrix instead of pro you, you see the slide right yeah i do uh, so it, 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 the original problem is simply multiplied by another matrix you see i mean um, instead of multiplying that or projecting that by by matrix phi which is the matrix of uh, generalized eigenvectors you multiply it by uh, a phi or a transpose and phi transpose okay but the solution is again the same is obviously the same in the limit, not in the reduced space. In the reduced space, there is an error associated to um, the number of modes that you take. Okay, thank you, Ramon. Okay, uh, Guillermo, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, it, my question is more general about the approach, the Rome approach. And I, I imagine that this method is useful when you can pre-run several simulations with varying boundary conditions and then when you want to know later uh, as particular boundary conditions you have to you can use the uh, the snapshots that you have generated before to solve that problem is that is that a correct understanding of of the method no the the method the uh, reduced uh, i mean model reduction has different applications I mean, the one that I have tried to explain here is perhaps the most obvious one. The most obvious one that means that you compute the high fidelity solution, let's say the full order model solution, uh, and then you obtain the basis, and then you want to run the the reduced order model, let's say, for longer time, for longer time, for example, or or uh, in fact, or whatever. There is the so-called parameterized. Uh, parameterized uh, reduced order modeling in which instead of uh, uh, let's say evolving in time what you do is you change uh, one of the parameters and that those parameters can be for example boundary conditions in the case of fluid mechanics could be the Reynolds numbers so you solve the full order model for example for three Reynolds numbers and then uh, you solve the reduced order model for a thousand Reynolds numbers for example in the context of an optimization or, for, or, or again, talking about optimization, you have a certain shape of your domain in, with, with three shapes you solve the full order model 
and then you uh, modify the shape slightly, but then you solve only the reduced order model with the basis that you have uh, constructed at the beginning. So the applications of reduced order modeling, model order reduction in general, are many. Uh, and I, have a, I haven't touched that point. The only thing I've said is that you have a problem, you compute the full order, the high fidelity solution, and then <coughs> you solve the same problem with the reduced order model. What could be the interest of that? Which could be the interest of doing this? For example, evolving for long, longer times. That could be a possibility, for instance. Okay, But uh, the applications are many, many. Uh, um, okay. Thank you. Uh, it seems that we have a couple of more questions, Ramon, if possible. Um, the first yeah, one is from Michele. Yes. Hello, Ramon. Hola, Michele. Uh, I can understand the, the, the use of the method in case of non-linearities, but what I cannot see is how to extend this in case of uh, a problem which depends on some historical variable, for instance, just to point out something with plasticity. So how can this work with, with something like this, which depends on the history? Because I cannot do this kind of snapshot. I cannot obtain the solution. No, 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 I do not agree. I do not agree. No, 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 no. You can obtain, you have, I mean, I don't know how it will work. I have no experience at all in the case of plasticity. But I think my, 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 my impression is that the procedure should be exactly the same. You solve the plastic, the plastic problem in the full order space, you compute the basis, and then you approximate the, the, the unknown in the space spanned by those bases. That does not mean that you will have to track the history of the approximated variable. Of course you will. Okay, so it's in a sense, uh, the, the, these these uh, reduced order models, the only thing they do is they give you a rule to construct a space of very small dimension. But once you construct that space of very small dimension, you can solve in principle any problem with or without history. As I said before, the separated scales are in fact uh, history variables because we, we, we take into account, we, we track them in time. And, and of course, we don't I have mean, any problem at all. It is, it's essential to have uh, time-dependent uh, um, uh, sub um, sub subgrid scales. It, it will be fundamental to have this, I mean. No, no, no. In our context, no, no. I mean, I was comparing subgrid scales to a historical variable. But in our, in our approach is to use subgrid scales and time-dependent. And we have found them very useful. Okay, that's what I have said. But what I'm saying is that uh, subgrid scales are something very similar, very similar to historical variables or history variables in the case of solid mechanics. Okay, and and we don't have any problem in using them. So I expect that you should not get, uh, you should not have any problem at all in using uh, history variables. The only thing is that you have to expand your unknown in the reduced order model space, and that's it. So we solve an evolution equation. That's the evolution equation we solve for the separate scales at each time step. But the unknown is already approximated in the reduced order model space. I mean, must be time dependent, the subscales. If not, it is impossible to, to follow a, an historical a problem with historical variables. This no, is, what this I is saying, no, 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 sorry. I, I'm not explaining correctly what I mean. In the case, in our case, in, in, in fluid mechanics, we use subgrid scales that can, can be either quasi-static or dynamic. But we have found that dynamic subgrid scales work much better. Okay. okay. In the case of solid mechanics, you could do forget about subgrid scales, for, forget about VMS, just Galerkin. In the case of, of, um, of solid mechanics, you could use the plain Galerkin method. And you could still have history variables. You should track them in time by solving an evolution equation, but the problem posed in the reduced order model space. So you would have, for the history variables, you would have an equation similar to that, similar to, one, to the equation that I am highlighting now. I don't know if you see it. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, no, it's so clear. you would have yeah. an equation that tells you that the time derivative of that history variable, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the subscale now, it would be the history variable, 
plus a certain ter term multiplying the history variable itself equals something. So that would be a general evolution equation at the Gauss point, at the, the integration point. Okay, okay. No, it's, it's more clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, the next one was uh, Alex Ferre, I think. Yes, uh, hi Ramon, you can hear me? Hello, Alex, ¿qué tal? Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering if um, if we could uh, think on changing uh, the norm in the minimization problem of the SBD. So if I well understood that uh, the SBD is minimizing a, a Frobenius norm of the yes. two spaces, could be uh, useful to think on optimization problem that uh, we use another norm or natural norm for the space, not uh, for venues, maybe involving in derivatives, uh, something like I, that. I, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. Uh, well, I haven't talked at, at all about that. I haven't talked at all. What we use uh, is, is something very, very classical. We use, uh, um, as I said, uh, POD, which is based on the singular value of the composition. Uh, and the singular value of the composition is based on the minimization of a certain Frobenius norm, as, as Alex was saying, okay? But I haven't even written down, down this norm here. I, I'm sure that you have many options there. I'm sure you have many options, but uh, uh, we don't have any experience at all in changing the norm in which you obtain the, the, the left generalized eigenvectors. I'm sorry. Okay, and, and the second question uh, would be, um, could be interesting also to split um, the basis uh, for different operators. For example, uh, having some basis for one, for the diffusion, another basis for convection, and, uh, and have them separately and use them together. So, so yes, that, that's yeah, that's again yeah yeah that, that that's also a, a point that could could be studied. Uh, in fact, the only little experience that we have related to this is to have uh, to perform a singular value decomposition of the velocity and the pressure separately, but okay. uh, or, or everything together. So uh, both options are, are possible in the case of fluid mechanics I'm talking. But uh, yes, another possibility would be to, to, to construct a basis or part of the basis that captures correctly the diffusive behavior, another part of the matrix or, or the basis that captures convection and then mix together the basis, yeah, that, that could be an option. Let me stress again that I haven't said anything about the way you compute that singular value decomposition, but what you have mentioned uh, are definitely two possibilities. One is uh, uh, use norms different to the standard one, and the other is to use, uh, uh, let's say, Basis that uh, optimize a certain component of the operator you are dealing with. Yeah, that that is possible, but I haven't been I haven't talked about that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so there is one last question, and this is the actually the last one from Xavi. Hey, hola, Ramon. Hola. Hey, uh, I have a question regarding uh, variational multi scales, and especially the like when you're treating the scales dynamically. Yes. So, Mike, I I understand that uh, you want to treat the scales dynamically to avoid the small time steps problem, no? Right. That's correct. But that's that's again something that I haven't mentioned. Yes. Yeah. yeah sure. No, but uh, my my question would be, what's how much more expensive it is to treat the scales dynamically when you are not in the small time steps regime? Uh... <laughs> because you have to do like a first projection, and then you have to also advance in time. If, if you are doing yeah, that, yeah. Too, the answer is sorry. always pays off. <laughs> so I, I, I cannot tell you exactly how expensive it is, but the answer is that it always pays off. Um, in fact, what you have to do, it, it's, it's just a problem of a storage because um, uh, you, when, you, when you're dealing, so one thing would be the ROM, so anything related to cost in the ROM is nothing, so okay. And the other thing would be the FOM, okay, the full order model. In the full order model, the cost could be relevant. The cost of uh, the cost of, of tracking in time the the subject scales, but you have it, it's a, it's a linear cost. So it grows with the number of elements, and and within each element, it grows with the number of integration points. Whereas the cost of assembling the matrix is is well, if you are using a, an optimal multi grid method, is going to be is going to be also linear, but in general, it's not. So it's what I want to say is that it's much more expensive. The global uh, the global operations are much more expensive than the local ones, and that is a local operation. 
Okay, so the answer is that it always pays off to track subscales in time. Okay, but then you store them like as a constant value per element. No, no. Usually we use like a, a value per integration point. Okay. Yeah. Say so per integration point. Yeah, okay. Per integration point. Yeah, that's yeah, yes, that's more memory you, demanding. If but. you look at this, for example, if you look at if you look at uh, at uh, any expression, let me see the final equations, for example. The final equations. Those are the final. Well, this is for the this is for the ROM, but the same would apply to the form. You, at, at the end, what you have to do is to perform this integral. Okay, this is an integral mm -hmm. over the element of. So, if you need to perform this integral, and you will do it numerically, of course, at the end, what you need is the value of the subgrid scale at the integration point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Great. Uh, I think that this brings us to the end of the seminar today. Uh, again, thank you very much, Ramon. Uh, it's been very welcome. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. You're welcome. Uh, and thank everybody for coming today. And let's see you in the next seminar. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.